welcome one and all to our final talk of the day. And before we get into it, just a reminder to people, our Knowledge Partners Packet Company are giving away free ebooks to those that are active. So if you are there, make sure at the end of the sessions you are rating them, leaving comments, and I expect plenty of questions from Michel at the end of this talk, but we've got to get to it. It's our keynote speaker to round out the day. Michel is here to talk about the conversational commerce and how it could easily save e-commerce. Michel, take it away. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Hey, folks, um, lovely to be here. Um, I'm speaking in the camera now. I'm probably going to turn my face to uh, my slides. So then you're going to be looking at the side of my face. But um, nice to meet you. Great that you're all here uh, and delighted to uh, speak to you uh, today. All right, here we go. Um, nice to meet you. So hey, I'm Michael. Um, I'm working the, um, in the strategy office of CM.com. Uh, we are based in the Netherlands. Um, so if you would like to connect with me on LinkedIn, please feel free to do so. So send me an invite, I'd love to talk to you uh, and connect. So just a quick introduction on um, the company I work for, um, it's CM.com. Um, and CM.com, it actually stands for Club Message, which is a name that came about in 1999. And let me just quickly tell you the founding story of our company and what that has to do with this potato. So here on the left, you see the first SMS text message that was ever sent from our platform. Um, and this dates back to 1999 when, you know, the internet was just breaking through, mobile phones were just breaking through. And there was two young high, stu high school, um, uh, university students actually, that saw that party goers in discos throw their flyer on the floor at the end of the evening, which is logical because of course, it's the worst moment to give somebody a marketing message. And they decided to start a company um, to offer discotheques and bars and clubs, the opportunity to send their members group SMS text messages. So you would get a text message uh, announcing DJs, competitions, and all kinds of events that were happening in the clubs. So there was this one bar in Belgium, actually, which is just a little bit below the south of the Netherlands, um, that um, and they, they gave them a chance. And they said, like, OK, you know, if this works, you know, we'll hire you. And they pulled a little trick, so they asked everybody you know, they send a text message asking the members to bring a potato to the bar that evening for free admission. And that evening, they ended up letting hundreds of people in for free. So this was the first proof that um, engagement in the, in the pocket, you know, to, to a channel that's in the pocket of your customer really works and brings in results. So, and it's, it's a pretty cool story because especially these young university students still run the company today. They still have a 54% share in CM.com. You see our office here within the background, our Norman, uh, which is there to protect us and to welcome us every day when we come to work. So we now have thousands of customers work for um, thousands of customers. We have about a thousand employees. Uh, we're present in about uh, 20 countries, also in Denmark. Um, and we have customers across, you know, 120 co countries. We're also a licensed payment provider and our platform sends billions of customer engagements per year across multiple channels. Um, we're, we're a real people company. You know, this is a lovely place in the south of the Netherlands with a big bistro. People love to come there. And it also reflects in how we take care of our customers. So, of course, there's global 24-7 monitoring support. You can actually always get us on the phone. And last but not least, we also have a stock listing in, um, uh, in the Netherlands. So this is what the company is. And what we do is probably best explained through this image. Because when you log into our platform, you're greeted, of course, with your own picture. And then in the middle is, is the channels, because we have a, a, a communication platform as a service. And it, we don't really care what channel you use. It's, it's all the same to us, SMS, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp. We're a channel agnostic company. Every feature that we launch works across all these different channels. Then on the left, um, there's the stuff that you know mere marketers like me use. So there's software, because you also need to look at an interface and to make sure you can utilize those channels to engineer end-to-end -end journeys for your customers. So we have a marketing cloud that includes a customer data platform, marketing automation software, landing page builder, pretty much everything you need to also unleash marketing across those channels. Um, a mobile service cloud, which is uh, an award-winning platform, about 20% of the e-commerce top 250 is on that platform in the Netherlands. A solid platform, communication-driven uh, platform, conversational-driven platform, not a ticketing platform. Uh, and then we have a conversational AI cloud, which is, of course, an AI solution that helps you, you know, communicate with your customers better. But there's also payments, so you can integrate payments in those channels, and you can actually do the whole journey for your customers. So that's everything about CM.com. 
And the story I want to tell you today starts again in 1999. And back in 1999, things were still rather simple. So these two devices broke through roughly around the same time, the internet and the mobile phone. And the desktop you used for searching, browsing, you know, buying already, or you, you know, you're looking at an occasional cat video. And then the mobile phone was really for calling and for texting. But in 2005, this thing started gaining traction. So with the smartphone, things started to converge and things also became a little bit more complicated. And still today, there's many things that you just can do on a mobile phone, you know, comparing products, more complicated tasks. You need your, you know, your different weaponry for it. So you need your mouse and your keyboard um, and not, you know, the easy to use GUI that's so easy, uh, easy for all. So today, still people struggle with disjointed journeys, multiple devices, um, uh, different devices, you know, try filling in a CAPTCHA, you know, while you're buying something on a mobile phone, you know, or a shopping cart filling in your address. It's still not optimal for the mobile experience. And my prediction here today is that a lot of that experience, if not everything, is going to move towards conversational channels, conversation as the next big interface for your customers. So let's dive in a little bit deeper on why that is. Well, I think, first of all, um, the conversation is sort of the perfect bridge between technology and humans. Because we humans, we we're born and bred to ask questions. This is what we do. I always say it's like a shark bites in something to find out what something is. We ask questions. And there's this Harvard psychologist that wrote a book, and he found out that in the, between the age of two and five, us sapiens, we ask more than 40,000 questions. That's about 30 a day. Now, I don't know if you, any of you has, has, has children. I, I do, and, and mine easily topped that. So people were, were born and bred to ask these questions. But something interesting happens after the age of five because that number drops a lot. And why is that? Well, first of all, it's because of parents. They, they say to their children, can you please ask or stop asking all these questions? But also in school, they're more focused on the kids giving them answers instead of asking questions. And your boss also tells you to stop questioning things and get to work. And it's also reflected in the standard that we have on the internet. So if you're talking customer service, like asking questions to businesses, this is still sort of like the paradigm on where it is. And, and this is, you know, one of the gemstones for my personal collection. I was throwing a party and I was asking for advice on wine, on crates of wine, actually. I needed a couple of boxes of wine. So I sent this message to a wine store and I get this one back. It says, dear wine lover, I already, I told them my name, but they already forgot. Thanks for contact. Your request is now registered under a contact number. So I just became a contact number. It's being reviewed by our support staff. It's like I'm requesting a new passport. We do our best to answer your question. That's not something I can count on, means nothing. Within two working days, an eternity in e-commerce. And please note, first go to the FAQ section. We really don't want to talk to you. And being sort of like as, as, as professionally deformed as I am, whenever I buy something online, I always ask a customer, customer service question. And I think about 70% of the replies I get is this reply. You know, it's a do not reply email. And, and it's, it's this sort of sentiment. This is really where a lot of the industry is still at, how they still look at communication, engagement with their customers. And I think this is really something of the past because customer expectations, they, they exploded in the last decade. And I think 2020 is, is, is a nice example of that because it's, it's the demographic tipping point where the millennial generation and generation Z are now the majority and they have completely different expectations. They want to use the channel of their choice. They want instant responses, instant gratification. They expect agents to understand who they are and have information about them. So the world has changed and businesses need to get up to par with this. And I think what is important is that you also need to change your business perspective. So whenever we sign up new customers for our customer service software, 
we always ask them, you know, what do you want to achieve? And they always say, well, we want happy customers. I always go, well, that, that, that's a great start. That, that's a great start. So customer satisfaction score, the CSAT score, yeah, that's something you can look at, you know, satisfied customers. It's a great start. But there is a problem with satisfied customers. And the problem with satisfied customers is that they leave. So between 60 and 80% of customers say they're satisfied or even very satisfied just before moving to the competition. And it's kind of logical because think of it, it's also about how you measure this stuff. If you make a purchase, for instance, on the e-commerce side, and you know they send you a survey right after the purchase, like, are you satisfied? No, super satisfied. I bought a great product. 10 minutes later, there's no order confirmation. And you need the, the present to be in tomorrow. Stress, complaining on Twitter. Bye-bye, customer satisfaction. That's how fast it goes. But you also hear all these magical things about customer service that it creates ambassadors and loyal customers and does all these things. So what is the secret of loyal customers? Well, when I started researching this, I, I ran into all this kind of advice. This was all based on the wow experience, on exceeding customer expectations. Amaze every customer every time. Difficult. Above and beyond customer support every time. Go beyond is not good enough. How to delight your customers. How to wow your customers. And I don't know, I, I, I sort of smell the rap because I, I worked with many, many web stores that you know, were struggling to, to do this customer service even remotely properly. So what's going on here? Then I ran into a research that, that I owe a lot of my insights to. This is a research done by the Customer Contact Council. 75,000 service interactions were researched across 21 industries in five continents. And they asked managers, like, if you exceed expectations, what would happen to your loyalty? Well, they all thought people would get more loyal. But the research showed that that line, that curve, actually starts flattening a lot after this ROI sweet spot. And it's actually kind of logical because each time you set an expectation, you create a new one. So you then need to jump over that. And do you know what your customer expectations are? Do people that work in your company know how to act on this intent? Very difficult thing to do. And, and most of at least the web stores that we worked for at the time, you know, they were mere mortal traders. You know, they knew everything about fashion, toilets, consumer electronics. They were not service specialists. So what is then the absolute key? Is there a silver bullet to loyalty? I found out from the same research that there is. There is a silver bullet, bullet for loyalty, so it's the lowest common denominator. And it's called effort reduction. Because when people, uh, consumers, customers, who experience low effort throughout their whole journey, 94% repurchases, 38% increases spend, and only 1% speaks negative about your brand. Whereas where they receive, where they experience high effort in the whole journey, only 4% repurchases. So you actually go into to, to, to the negative, you kind of lose double here. So reducing customer effort is really your northern star whenever you start getting busy with optimizing customer experiences. So, Customer experience, I just mentioned it, throughout the whole journey. So that's all the touch points. This is really the beast that drives customer loyalty or customer stickiness, whatever you want to call it. And it, 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 it shines across all the, all the research in different statistics, whether or not it's Forrester, Gardner, Harvard, McKinsey, whatever. It all tell the same story. So customer experience drives customer loyalty. But the other end of the sword is also true. Because if you get it wrong, 32% of your customers will leave after one bad experience. That's one third. And nearly two thirds bails after two bad experiences, even if they love your brand. And this is all has to do with negativity bias. We humans, we experience negative emotions way more intensely than how we experience positive emotions. We remember them longer, we tell them to other people, we suck on them much longer. And it also shows, because when you see um, a research, same research that I mentioned before, this is what customers find most important in customer experience and what they're willing to pay more for. 
And look what is in the upper right corner. It's very basic stuff. Efficiency, they want to get the job done. Convenience, easy payments. And mentioned separately, friendly service and knowledgeable service, all the way up there. This is what customers find most important in customer experience. And it's difficult because the field of customer experience, CX, as you call it in the industry, it, it, it has a problem. And the problem, it shines through in the definition. And you can see I used a nine-headed dragon here at the back of my slide, so you can kind of see where I'm going with this. Here's the definition. CX is the sum total of customers' perceptions and feelings resulting from interactions with your brand. Huh. Okay. So that's perceptions and feelings. These are subjective. And then the sum total of those from all your customers across all the touch points with your brand. This is definitely a nine-headed dragon to start optimizing. So how good are we in this? So if, if it drives you know, loyalty, you know, we as an industry we must be really good at it. Well, there is something called the CX gap. And it's a gap between what we think and what our customers think. So there was this legendary research, and it was conducted by Mr. Reichelt, the guy who invented the net promoter score, the NPS score. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they asked these executives, do you think you offer a great CX? And 80% of them said, we offer a great CX. They asked their customers, only 8% agreed. So here's the CX gap. And it's still alive and well today. So this is a bit of an older research. And I tried to find a research that asked a similar question. And when I found it, similar question was asked. 72% of the companies said, look, no, we're, we're doing great. And 13% of their customers agreed. So this was 12 year progress. Now let's look at 2022. This is the Forrester CX index, probably the most credible index in the world on measuring customer experience capabilities from com companies. And only 15% of the companies in that index is rated as excellent. And this year, 19% of them dropped. And in total, the overall index also dropped. So it goes to show that customer experience, the key thing to building loyalty, is a really difficult thing to get down. And this is where conversations are going to come to the rescue. I think a new field will emerge, and it's going to be called conversational CX, to actually have the whole experience happening inside a conversation. So, of course, with, um, uh, with the rise of messaging channels, AI, generative AI, straight through processing, there will pretty much be nothing that you cannot be done anymore inside a conversation. So you can change your seat on an airplane. Uh, we have a big energy company where you can actually agree to a down payment scheme when you're behind on your payments. Ordering a pizza. This is just the beginning of it. So just imagine what, what that would do. You now go to a website and you need to go through the HTML and through the Google optimized shopping experience. What about if you could just ask? That would also solve a lot of problems, right? You know, Can you compare this product to that product? How does it relate to that? That's the future I'm painting for you today. And it's also going to have a massive impact on e-commerce. It's called conversational commerce. And does it need saving? Definitely. Because on average, you know, a normal brick and mortar store, it still converts 10 times more than online. And maybe even more surprisingly, less than 20% of all retail is online. This is a worldwide average. And it's post-corona. So, for instance, in the Netherlands, it's, it's 22, 23. In other countries, it's lower. Um, but the world average is 20%. So 80% of all retail, still brick and mortar. And conversational commerce is going to change that. It's going to pull those numbers closer together. So buying via messaging channels or even digital voice assistants. So these messaging channels, there's about 5 billion active users now today. And of course, there's different market leaders in every country. In the Netherlands, it's, it's WhatsApp. Uh, in, in, in the US, it's text messaging. And on a second, it's Messenger. 
In other countries, it's Telegram or Viber. It doesn't really matter, but it's a direct line with customers. They have this thing in their pocket. They're getting a messaging notification whenever you send them a message. Also, active digital voice assistants, 4.2 billion people use these things now to set little reminders or maybe, you know, to make an, an appointment with a hairdresser or to buy cat food via Alexa. It's possible it's a growing field. And big tech has got a really big stake in this. The big tech, tech companies will be responsible for creating many more conversation entry points into your business. So here all the way on the left is Google Messages. And maybe you've seen the button pop up here and there because they're integrating this with Google Maps. So whenever you're looking for a retailer, you know, and you're looking for directions, right next to the direction button, there will be a chat button. And you have a direct communication with the store, usually via the head office. There's always a little chat bot there for first triage and for some routing. But it's a new conversation entry point, and you will see those chat buttons pop up more and more and more. A good second is Messenger. Messenger, I think, is a little bit more dedicated to e-commerce, to the shopping experience, um, uh, virtual assistants, um, really big channel in, uh, in the US. Um, and a third one is Apple, because Apple has also got its own native solution. It's called Apple Chat for Businesses. It works through the SMS protocol, but it's natively integrated in all your Apple devices. So whenever you go to your, to your, 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 your contacts, you find a contact, you look up a store, and there will be a chat button right next to the phone button. And these things work on your, on your iPhone, on your iMac, on your iPad, and even on your iWatch. And then lastly, um, we have, I think, the, the big leader is WhatsApp. Because Meta, um, the, 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 the mother company from WhatsApp and Facebook, is really planning to turn WhatsApp into the next yellow pages. Now, maybe if you're young, you don't even know what the yellow pages are, but every single store, every single company used to be in the yellow pages. And this is what's gonna to happen to WhatsApp. Every single company will be findable and contactable via WhatsApp. People will be expecting this. So you can, you can, you can bet on it that it's gonna happen. So this is just the channels, but there's more than the story than channels because there's also payments. And of course, China being China, they're light years ahead with this. So if you take WeChat, the leading messaging uh, platform in China, more than 90% of the 1 billion users have already used the native WeChat pay solution to make a purchase inside the channel. Now you understand that of course, Apple and Google also have their own payment solution. And even Instagram has announced their own native payment solution. So all these guys, they're launching their own payment solution because they want to be able to offer these payments seamlessly in a conversation. Let me give you a little example of a personalized buying experience in a single conversation. This is a mock-up. Um, uh, one of our customers made this. They're, they're, they're working on it with our technology. They're called Your Surprise. These guys, they sell um, gifts, personalized gifts on, um, on the internet. So you can buy a cup or a mug or something that you can personalize with a picture. And um, so you're being greeted on the website and they're asking you like, hey, are you looking for anything specific? Well, I'm looking for a gift for my mother. Oh, what's the occasion? Her birthday. Ah, so now a customer segment is already connected to an event. So they must have this stuff sliced and diced in the back end with data, right? They know this. So now the consumer can upload a couple of pictures to um, personalize the product. They ping the product information system and it gives back these products. You can go through the carousel. This is also a functionality that you have in all those messaging channels. And then you get the moment of magic in channel payment. And when they then have another question, well, they continue in the same conversation. And this is, I think also hinting on another trend that we all need to be aware of. Because the lines between marketing, service, and sales, they're blurring. Your customer is speaking to a brand. They're not speaking to a marketing department, a sales department. They're not distinguishing this anymore. And I, I think a good example is what you see here on, on, on the right. is it, it, it's, it's a product we're selling quite a lot of. It's newsletters in WhatsApp or Instagram. 
So, you know, this is for the early sale, or you can notify people when something is back on stock. But imagine this, you know, you, you have an opt-in from your customer. Um, you can send them a WhatsApp message for, you know, the new sale or for when a product restocks. Now, this is a marketing message, right? And they might have a question on this. So then it becomes a service conversation. And then they can automatically buy it inside this channel. So here is pretty much everything that can happen in the journey happening within one channel. So these lines are blurring, and I think it will also have impact on uh, how we work in the future. Because we're now organized in silos, right? We work for a marketing department, a service department. But it's, 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 it's my, my, my guess that in about five years' time, we will see companies start converging and we will see multidisciplinary teams come up. It's already happening. I think at Airbnb, at HubSpot, they're doing it, at, at other tech companies as well. You have multidisciplinary companies of teams where um, people from the UX team, salespeople, marketing people, service people, and they work on segments. So for instance, on age or on an, another segment, depending on how you want to slice and dice your customers. So this will have impact on how we, uh, how we work. Okay, um, I have two things to, uh, to wrap this up. So wrapping this story up, I would like to present you with a little model. It's the anatomy of the new customer dialogue. So what are the main ingredients with this new way of interacting with customers? Well, I think first of all, it is conversational. And it sounds maybe a little pat, but it's quite different from the little message that I showed you, right? Dear wine lover, you're registered under number such and so. So making it conversational is all about making it, you know, with natural language, with actually understanding how people talk, with understanding these personas, speaking in their language, keeping the, course, the, 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 the conversation conversational. Um, and, and I think ChatGTP will have a big influence on this um, because this thing, of course, is at a major traction and it will impact how people um, experience the experience they have with chatbots. It's so much more natural. Secondly, it will be personalized. So if, if you have a brand that people trust and if you have good offerings, all the data shows that you can actually use the data with, that people give you especially when they're already a customer. So a more data-driven approach, you can just offer people the things that they need. What I just showed you, when are these shoes in restock? Can you play me? please tell me when these things are back in sale? So a more personalized approach in line with the individual's needs. Second, proactive. Um, I, I think the, the service paradigm is still in the reactive, you know, like I just showed you, dear wine lover. But you can also act on the potential issues and opportunities before the customer does. And I think the Internet of Things will have big impact on this. So when more and more devices are connected, um, um, uh, producers will, of the, the, the manufacturers will also be able to fix those devices on distance and they will message customers when something happened to their device. For instance, when your Wi-Fi was optimized from, uh, by your Internet provider. So proactive service will be something that we will see much more of in the next five years. Channel agnostic. Um, the channels doesn't don't really matter. These things need to work seamlessly, you know, across different channels, devices, and even modalities in the future. Um, last year, the European Committee um, they said yes to the Digital Markets Act. This means that we're going to get messaging interoperability. So when I'm on Signal and you are on WhatsApp, I can just send you a text message. And the same will go for businesses. You will just be able to have conversations across different channels, depending on where you are, what your need is, and it will all be seamless. Uh, it will be a seamless, frictionless experience. Then connected. So what I just showed you in that in that little video with the gifts, this is connected to the backend. So the more systems you're able to connect, uh, the better experience you will have. And a little while back, I was flying with SAS and I, um, I needed to book an extra suitcase, but I didn't get a receipt and I needed to expense it. So I asked the chatbot, it's like, oh, I, I need a receipt and I, I, I upgraded my suitcase. And to my big surprise, it says, sure. Okay, what's your email address? This is my email. What's your booking number? And it just gave me a link where I could download it. 
So apparently this question was asked more than once and they said like, hey, let's create this integration. So you will see more and more and more systems getting connected to this conversational stream to give instant issue gratification. Then the one before the last, it's blended. So please don't think you can automate this whole thing with a chatbot yet. Yes, ChatGPT is great, but it's only as good as the stuff that you put in. And there is also a long tail. So you can see about 20% of the questions usually businesses get are stuff they get a lot. And then the other 80%, it's all kinds of individual questions people have depending on their specific product, their specific needs. So this, th th this whole process will be blended for a very long time. Um, but I do think that humans will get more and more aid from artificial intelligence to up their performance to give a, a, a better experience, a more personalized experience to the customers they're talking to. And then lastly, it's real time. Yes, messaging is asynchronous. So, you know, you can have a little roadmap, but this is what we always do, you know, when we start working with customers and what's your goal? Well, you know, we, 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 we're really bad in this customer service thing. So first we want to answer our emails within, 60, within, within uh, one day. So then we start helping them, we optimize it, and then you do it within 60, uh, within, um, uh, within one day. Uh, and then, you know, they can do it within half a day and then within an hour, and then they start adopting new channels. So WhatsApp, okay, within 20 minutes. And then you send people a little message, okay, within 20 minutes, you get an answer and it's fine. But ultimately, the best, the best gratification is in solving things in the moment. When people have an issue, they want it solved now. So the industry is moving more and more and more towards real time. So this is what you need to work towards. Okay, I'm closing off. I'm usually advising people to um, start small. By all means, start small, but above everything else, prepare for big. I'm giving you five essential building stones for your engagement strategy. The first one is secure C-level buy-in. This thing is not happening without commander's intent. So, you know, in my opinion, experience actually, you, you have two sort of, two sort of companies. Um, the first company finds it a necessary evil to speak to customers and the other company finds it, every conversation is an opportunity to deepen the relationship. And it has a lot to do with the business model. If you have the margin, the purchase frequency, if you have that, you know, lifetime value with a customer to do this. But when you do, you do absolutely need C-level buy-in. So when you don't have it, educate them, find the right data, um, um, uh, talk to your customers, see where they need most help, what, 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 what brought most favorable responses with your customers. Get buy-in from people bottom up and start making the case to the C-level because you need their buy-in to, um, uh, to unleash a strategy like this successfully. Secondly, Prioritize the backend operations. I'm talking not about the shiny objects on the front, the boring stuff. Like you need to have your supply chain optimized. When an order is delayed, your customer service agents absolutely need to have insights into where that order is. You need to have systems connected. So whenever the backend operations is a mess, your front end customer experience is a mess too. Thirdly, establish a single source of truth. Now, this might sound a little obvious. I know I'm talking to a marketing crowd here, but um, to be honest, you know, more than half of the customers, if not more, that I talk to still don't have this down. They do not have a single source of truth for their data. And if you want to start getting, you know, more sophisticated with personalization, um, if you want to get sophisticated with proactive service, you absolutely need that one view of the customer where all the, where the customer, the individual customer profile is enriched with the right data, with complete data from transactional data to customer service questions to marketing responses. You need to have this one view of the customer also to in the future, start doing more fancy stuff with AI because you need more data and better data to get better results from uh, AI automation. Four, well, I said it before, so I can skip it here. It's channel agnostic technology. I mean, you don't want to get stuck in hell where, you know, you, you, you cannot deploy one chatbot flow in a different channel because it's not connected. 
you, you absolutely need channel agnostic technology. It's hygiene. And then number five, it's you need to build conversational capabilities, both on the human side as well as on the AI side. So you have lots of different technology for this. You, you now have, um, you know, of course, chat DTP, the generative AI. But I always recommend to use that in combination with the conversational AI solution because you also need some control. You don't want to have um, uh, the entire customer experience in the hands of upvotes and downvotes of your customers because uh, that's what happens if you uh, if, if you put it totally in the hands of chat DPT. Um, and you, you need to also focus on understanding your customers. And I, I, I think this guy, he's a, he's, a, he's a conversational designer. I met on an, on an event once. He said, will chat DTP replace chatbots? Have you, have you ever asked the question? No. Have you ever tried to persuade something to do something? No. Have you ever tried to read you huh, as a person? No. That's the job of the conversational designer. And I, I think the, the job of the conversational designer will be more and more the prompt designer. The designer that you know you need to you need to understand the questions people have about your business and the appropriate answers so the better you understand your customers the better you're able to engineer those conversations and to make sure you offering these frictionless experiences across all the stages in the journey okay folks i think that concludes it for today where are we in terms of time 36 minutes and 36 seconds that's not bad. Not Since bad. It's the presentation, the, the end of the day for you guys. So uh, we started a little bit, uh, we stopped a little bit earlier than an hour, and we at least uh, plenty of time for questions. Absolutely. So, folks, if you got any questions, make sure you click on the Q and A tab and type out your questions there. Remember, uh, by participating in that regard and other ways, you will be in with a chance of also getting some free eBooks via our Knowledge Partners Pack Company. Um, but really insightful. Love to hear it, Mihil. Uh, my, my thoughts kind of like leading into this is, you know, uh, what I was taking away and what I've heard throughout the day is this kind of notion that that people want to feel heard, right? They, they want to be talked to without feeling coddled to a patronizing degree, right? Like I think there's a, an element of companies more recently telling people what they want based on statistics and whatnot. And it sounds like what you're really kind of leaning towards is this idea of listening, making it more of a back and forth conversation instead of just saying, well, you know, we've, we've bought you know, X amount worth of, of stats here that show this is your buying behavior and this is what we're going to push. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the, the way I, that would translate for me, there's no substitute for caring. If you really care for your customers, then people can smell it. You know, they can smell it by looking at your website and seeing, hey, these guys say, you know, they're they're here with live chat. They say, we respond within one hour. This is the kind of stuff where people go, huh, they're, they're, they're on the ball, you know. People people, people feel this. Um, and, and I think the same thing goes for marketing. So if you're talking about personalization, I think us marketers, we would like to do a lot of personalization before somebody bought something. But people want personalization after they bought something. So you need to find a strategy where you deliver the most value to your customers and make sure you start leveraging that. So really centralizing that customer. So no substitute for caring, I think. That's an interesting point you make about, you know, like nowadays it basically being focused on after the purchase. Whereas I guess like traditionally you think back, you know, 80s, 90s, you had salesmen, right? You had people pitching to you. They were explaining to yeah. you why it was beneficial to you. The classic like sell me a pen type notion. Yeah. And that, that's disappeared, right? In this kind of mass, yeah. um, just I just call it, I can call it mass scudding approach yeah. throughout the day, right? Of just yeah. spam ads everywhere and we'll see what catches. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, so it looks like we've got a few coming through. It looks like Kate's asking, are conversations as important for B2B as they are for B2C? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, B two C is it's it's funny. I mean, um, we I come from before CM.com, I was with a company called RobinHQ.com. We sold that company to CM. We're now the mobile service cloud, and we started in e-commerce. And this story that you need to really be there for your customers, personal service, like like in a normal store, there's somebody behind the counter. A website, there also needs to be somebody behind the counter. This started resonating in 2015, and then the B two B side they joined in you know 2020. Then we have big B2B players in food or in Medicare that are really opening up to people. And, and you know, like, like on WhatsApp, for instance, WhatsApp business um, and engineering that 
um, um, having account managers available on WhatsApp at business via one uh, phone number. So yeah, I think B2B is, is joining in a big way. And uh, I believe we had another one coming through in regard. Uh, it's, it's an interesting one from Dagmar because it's such a, a young thing. But they're asking, uh, in which sector of business is conversational chat GPT used nowadays? I, I guess maybe like because it's so young, also a great way of focusing that question is where do you see it being used in the short term future as well? I mean, if you take the whole field of generative AI, um, I think in the short term, it, it will really help professionals work more effectively and really start getting their value upping their value so for instance when i need to write a white paper you know i i ask chat ttp for a setup that's great i have a setup now i completely change it around but having that first setup it, it saved me so much ram it's 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 amazing so chat ttp is is really good in in summarizing things, in, in, in clustering things. But if there's one thing Chat DTP cannot do, it synthesize things. So it makes a summary, but it cannot bring in a new insight. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a large language model. So it it, it, it just predicts the next word. So um, I think it will have massive impact on customer service. So more and more questions that are you know repeatable will get automized. And um, it will leave more space for humans to do what they're best in. Uh, that's a fair way of looking at it. I know there's, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not sure if that answers your question. <laughs> I, I think it's a fair kind of stepping point, right? Because what I was going to leave with was this whole notion of like this concern that, you know, the, the AI will be able to do everything, that the, the human will become irrelevant. And I love something that uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson said on this matter, right? Where there were bots of him that were quoting him. And he found it quite comical. He said, I, I don't ever feel threatened because it doesn't know what I'm going to say next because I don't necessarily, right? It's that whole concept of creating new from nothing. And that's where I believe you you hit on uh, the nail on the head in that regard, the whole concept of conversation designers, right? Like the goal, your piece in the puzzle has changed, but it's still fundamental to even allowing the, these chat GPT type bots to function. Yeah, ex exactly. And, and, and also don't forget that um, uh, chat GPT doesn't know anything about your business. So they know the public corpus of text out there, but they do not know um, why, which cm.com product is special, how we deal with customers, what our processes are. You just need to train that. And then it just, it, it could come up with, it could generate answers or even content, but then there's no observability and control. So you do want to have a little bit of observability and control there. So it's all about placing those boundaries and, and essentially trying to engineer, you know, journeys that your customers uh, uh, love that are frictionless and that uh, deliver value. I think like the, the interesting thing is with a, a lot of concern, right? You think about the kind of uh, ramifications of AI and how that can be involved. Like, you know, you can see a lot of people lose their jobs. We, we talked about this earlier today, that notion that it's the same as when farming moved from, you know, handwork to kind of you know, using industry machines, right? It's the evolution yeah. of your job roles and that you have to remain fluid. I, I guess one cool idea is this concept of, you know, you talked about how you can use ChatGPT as part of the process but leading into humans later, possibly, there might even be opportunities for businesses to tailor themselves around that justification. I think one of the classic ones that comes to mind is it used to be this idea of, you know, we have uh, call centers in America or whatnot, right? And that was a premium element that people were willing to pay the extra for. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So when the going gets tough, you want somebody to have your back. Mm. So so you, you have now a new airliner in the US, Frontier. And they have really, really decimized um, um, human service because of costs. And it'll be interesting because if you if you want the cheapest ticket, you know that you have a really cheap ticket, and that you know if I go to Ryanair, I also know the, the service is pretty not yeah. so good. So, but when I book, you know, tickets to Asia with my whole family, man, I'm I'm going to pay a little bit more because I want people to have my back. I'm traveling with my family. It's it's a long distance flight. You know, you, you want. So this is all about weighing propositions and, and then taking, you know, the brand positioning in, into account. Yeah, it's, it's the personal touch, right? It's that whole idea of this kind of like mass audience approach has become a little bit lazy, right? I, I think it's a fair yeah. way of saying there isn't really Absolutely. much respect involved in it. And what you're trying to do is provide a, a, 
a framework to get back to what mattered, right? Like I, I said at the start of the day, the concept that in the 80s, 90s, advertising was at its prime in a lot of people's eyes, right? Like the yeah. advertising agencies fought about what does the person want? What's going to invoke an emotion? What's going to get a smile on their face? Just something as basic as that Absolutely. kept them in their memory and built that relationship. Yeah, yeah. Um, I believe we've got a question come through from Maria. She asked, what do you think about automations on platforms such as Instagram? Uh, do they have enough functionality to create chatbots there? I think the whole point she's going on is, you know, there's been talks with OnlyFans as well, those type of places. Are, are, are the AI systems at a point where they can essentially replace the human interaction on those platforms and not require our input at all? <laughs> well, there's sort of two elements to that question. So first of all, there's the channel. So there's Instagram. So let's take Instagram DM. Uh, and then you can have vendors such as CM.com that deliver you a full-on chat platform that you connect to that channel. And then you can engineer this whole journey. Whether or not you know it can completely uh, replace people, uh, it, it it really depends on 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 the business case. If it's a very simple thing you're you're selling and your information is absolutely top notch, then maybe it can replace a lot of the people. If you know what people what, what kind of questions they have, then you can have chatbots answering those questions. But in my experience, when you zoom out on a business, it's usually the you know the long tail. So twenty percent of the questions you know you see them a lot. And then 80% are just all these individual cases. Yeah, but what about if I wear it in this outfit or with that situation? And people have, um, have um, can, ha can have you know individual questions. That's fair. And I think it's like we've seen, we're starting to see even whole YouTube channels crop up that are basically just ran by an AI system, right? And I guess the notion there is like as those scale, Maybe even when you look beyond just their own channel to the whole concept of sponsorships, advertising, those type of things. Yeah. If the models you're talking about come into place, the yeah. desire of those platforms for advertising is less, right? Because yeah. they aren't a true experience and people are going to realize it. Yeah. I mean, at a certain point, once we get all, you know, all AI happy, we might all look the same. So, you know, how are you going to keep your individual voice? You know, how are you going to have that shine through? I think that'll be a very interesting development uh, to see in the in the next what coming years. Definitely, I think it's the the concept like the the the, the classic statement was the uncanny valley, right? Which in some ways yeah. we're we're getting beyond, but I feel like there's a point ahead of us where at first this interaction with things like ChatGPT feels good, but eventually we're going to knowing that it's fake, right? Every time you know it's yeah. fake, you're going to reach a point where you're going to reach out for that real contact, which the system yeah. you're talking about is yeah. still going to have that. Yeah, I mean, uh, there, there was a, a research from Gartner in 2021 where they uh, interviewed a whole bunch of customers, like 5,000 of them, I think. And I think 75% of them, uh, they, they forecasted that 75% of customers would, at one point in time, contact customer service because they just wanted to talk to a person, essentially because they're lonely. So that, that'll be an interesting development to see how that's going to, you know, be in the mix and I, I i think you know broadly my vision is uh, in the next you know 10 years we'll see the number of brand conversations rise a lot more brand conversations most of them will be automated you know 98 percent will be automated and then you know or, or, or 95 percent, and then five percent will be answered by people who will be uh, augmented with ai to help the person better uh, and then what the tipping point is in terms of volume compared to how it is now for real life customer service agents, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, but, uh, you know, maybe it will never be there. But, um, you know, I think human service will always be something that's valuable in, you know, certain value propositions. I mean, those percentages are sombering for though, right? Like basically three quarters of people kind of being in that situation. But yeah, I, I think the positive note to take away as you're highlighting is this notion that like people want to reach out to other people still, right? So like this, this worry that everything's gonna be automated and you know, people's jobs become less relevant. And also we get very plain now instead of tailored our experience. It, it feels like yeah. it's the opposite is what's due for us in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there's going to be more automation, more platforms, more content. You know, we're going to also going to screw up more as 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 people trying all this stuff out. So, um, so you know, there will always be a need for 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 you know for, for good customer service and also for uh, the for 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 the right marketing propositions. People, you know, companies that understand their customers. I think the customer intimacy model, I think, is really the most sustainable business model for the future.
yeah, it maintains loyalty as well, right? Like so many people go for the one-off purchases, but if they realize that you're there, yeah. it's that kind of like building, we talked about building brands as opposed to just advertising earlier. It's that concept, right? It's something that you relate to. Yeah. And I think you, you highlighted earlier, right? Like just two bad experiences and people are, are out the door, right? It shows yeah. you how detached they are from being invested in the products. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we've got a question for you from Corilla. She asks, uh, I really liked your perspective of autoresponder for service, but how do you think uh, it should, oh, sorry, I'm going to have to rejig that, how it should look like for the customer? Is it uh, a need sometimes? I'm asking about regular services without 24-7 chat options. Sorry, did I? You, you need to run the question by me. By me sorry, again. yeah, I, I'm, I'm just deciphering. <laughs> Apologies, Corilla. If you want to try putting that for again, I'm going to try to like interpret though. Um, the the concept of auto response, I think she was kind of leaning into what we talked about a little bit already. Um, how like I think I think you actually broke it down already, right? You talked about the percentages. Like you think it's going to be just to re-highlight really this idea that it's going to break down to you know auto response could can make up like you know ninety ninety five percent of uh, the interactions that the customers have. Five percent will be uh, human aided, but still driven by the AI. And then you'll have maybe a, a very small trickle at the bottom that actually require true human presence in those uh, yeah. customer services. Yeah, and that volume still might be massive because I think yeah. the number of brand conversations are going to rise. Uh, and, and I think the, the degree in which chatbots will be able to answer questions will also have a lot to do with understanding customers. Mm -hmm. Because even when, when, when you're thinking out like, um, you know, you, you have your, your knowledge bases, you know, you're frequently asked questions. Well, if they would like be a cure for everything, then you wouldn't have any questions. And 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 that's pretty much what what you have available online for people. So and then still people still have questions. So I think it will be a long time for before we actually are able to fully automate that uh, experience. Of course, depending on the business that you're uh, that you're in. But um, but yeah, I think uh, it's going to be a while before that uh, before that happens. No, I definitely agree on the idea that you know those numbers of true and human interactions on their own before we consider yeah. the other elements are going up because what you're talking about from what we've come from, it is a conversational model, right? Where the conversation yeah. has not really been there. Brands are now reaching a point where, you know, instead of having their, their closed DMs to give the classic of like Twitter, it's going to be open. It's going to be more interactive. And the cool thing about things like ChatGPT, especially in those environments, like I mentioned, Twitter is they can actually provide on your side of the, the you know the the uh, table a filter method to get useful feedback through what is traditionally I seen I'd say been a very difficult area to find it right because of how many people may troll or may just have negative experiences yeah which yeah are yeah are incohesive yeah right I think though that is there's all the questions that that I can see coming through. Um, I'll just put this back up on screen. Like, you know, I, I, oh, it, I think it has your, does it have your thing or is it? No, okay. you know, well, my, my LinkedIn profile. Yeah. Whenever people yeah. have questions, you know, Michiel Gasteland, Michael Gasteland on, on LinkedIn, there's only one, fortunately. So feel free to connect and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Hey, with the amount of knowledge you just gave over to us, I think only one is enough, Michiel. You've been absolutely <laughs> wonderful to talk to. Uh, it's a Thank great you so way much. to round out the day no thank you i think we uh we all learned something here and guys go check out cm.com be sure to contact him if you have any more questions but i think with that we'll bring it to a close uh, thank you again Miguel. thank you very much uh, absolute pleasure hopefully we'll see you again soon have a lovely day thank you take care you too bye-bye Okay, so that is going to uh, bring us to a close. Before we close out, just a reminder, this is just day one. There's still more amazing lessons to be learned, which is why you need to mark your calendar. Make sure your alarm is set. 10 a.m. local time or 8 a.m. GMT plus zero zero if you want to know when we start off tomorrow. A big thank you, though, to all of the speakers we've had today, as well as the hosts on the other tracks that have been working tirelessly. And thank you to all of you for tuning in. But I'm going to allow you to all now go and rest your brains and return tomorrow, as I said, 8 a.m. GMT plus zero, where we will kick off once again another day packed full of information, information that you don't want to miss. I'll see you then. This is all we got, dreaming about a revolution in our minds. This is all we got. Lock me out of this life institution. I am angry and I am illusions. Yes, I hate, but it's not a solution. Try my best, buddy, I'm just a human.